Today's question is about DNG files. What are they and should you be using them in your workflow? I'm gonna talk about it on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey everybody, welcome back. Here I am as always answering your photography questions. Have you got questions related to photography? Send them my way. Go to askdavidbergman.com. There's a form there you can fill out. Submit it and I will do my best to answer it right here on a future show. Today I've got two questions from two different people but they are about a similar thing. The first one is from Joseph and he asks, I shoot raw. When I import into Lightroom, should I keep them in raw or convert to DNG? I was told DNG is better. The second question is from Cody B and he asked, the images from my Canon M50 are raw CR2 files, but then I convert them to DNG. Does this compromise my ability to work on them in post-production? Okay, first let's talk about raw files. What are they? Well, in most cameras, you can choose to shoot either raw or JPEG. When shooting raw, you're electing to save all of the raw data that's captured by the sensor directly to the card with no processing applied. So if you shoot JPEGs only, the camera applies all that processing, things like white balance, tone curves, and a bunch of other things, and then flattens all of that data and saves a compressed file to your card. I actually did a two minute tips episode a few years ago about raw versus JPEG, and I'm gonna put a link down below if you wanna watch that. But suffice it to say, I highly recommend shooting raw in almost all cases. Unlike JPEG, however, raw files are saved in a proprietary format created by the company that made your camera. So you might see files from Canon that end with uh, .CR2 or CR3, and Nikon files sometimes have the extension NEF. Those are raw files, but the trick is that the camera companies don't release the software development kit, otherwise known as the SDK, for any outside company to read their files. They want us to use their software to open and edit those raw files. So in Canon's case, you need to use Digital Photo Pro really to read those CR2 and CR3 files. Now each camera of course uses a different format and even cameras by the same company sometimes have new raw, raw file formats that aren't compatible with older software. In 2004, Adobe released a new raw file called DNG, which stands for digital negative. The idea was for DNG to be an archival format, so you could convert all of your camera's raw files to DNG either on import into Photoshop or Lightroom, or you could convert them after the fact using their free DNG converter. Now, since it's like each camera speaks a completely different language, Adobe wanted to get rid of this Tower of Babel by creating a standard open source raw file format that everyone could use. This really seems like a great idea, but I'm not sure it's actually lived up to expectations. Let's, go th let's actually go through some of the supposed benefits of using the DNG format. One, the format is open source. Adobe's made the SDK available for anyone to use for free and third party companies don't have to pay for a license to be able to read and write those files. Now since the documentation is freely available, that should mean you'll always be able to open even very old DNG files forever using any software that supports the format. This can actually be really important for your archive as it grows over time and over the years. Number two, Next is processing speed. If you're using Adobe software like Lightroom, a DNG file theoretically can be opened and adjusted faster than a raw file from another company since it's supported natively and doesn't have to be reverse engineered. Number three, there are no sidecar files. When you work on a camera raw file in any third party program like Lightroom or Capture One, a little tiny small sidecar XMP file is created with every image to store that metadata and it has to stay with the image file or you'll have to redo all of your edit settings from scratch. The DNG file actually embeds that metadata in the file itself, making data management just a bit easier. Number four, it produces smaller file sizes without any loss in quality. Generally speaking, DNG files are usually about 15% smaller than their corresponding raw files. There are some exceptions, which I'm gonna go over shortly. And number five is file validation. The DNG format does include checksum information in the file to detect file corruption. So with all that, it seems like there are some good reasons to be using an all DNG workflow, but let's talk about some of the benefits of using the camera's native raw format. First of all, you don't lose any data. It's true that the DNG format doesn't lose any image quality per se. It's what we call a lossless format, but there are some pieces of proprietary camera-specific metadata that get wiped in some cases. Things like focus points, picture styles, and even like active delighting aren't stored anywhere in the DNG, so it's impossible to recover this data in the future if you ever want to. 
In the case of Canon, you might be shooting using a special mode like dual pixel raw, and then that actually can't be converted to DNG at all. Nobody really shoots that yet, but maybe someday. Uh, number two, time. Uh, the big players in the photo industry like Canon, Nikon, Sony, they don't actually uh, shoot natively DNG. So that means you have to convert those RAW files to DNG after import or after the fact, and that takes a lot of extra time. Also, DNG needs to be supported by the software you're using. Of course, it works fine on Adobe products like Lightroom and Photoshop, but if you're using Capture One or any other program to handle your RAW files, your images might not look right or they might not even be compatible at all. And now, going back over the benefits of DNG that I mentioned before, you may seem that they're not as beneficial as they might have sounded at first. Yes, DNG is open source and free, but the reality is that very few camera companies have switched to it and prefer to use their own proprietary RAW files. In this post-Tower of Babel utopia that they imagined, it would have been nice if everyone used the format. JPEG's a perfect example of how it should work. Every camera shoots to the JPEG standard, and every piece of photo software can read and write those files. But camera companies protect their much more important RAW files and keep their own special sauce as a closely guarded secret. Uh, as far as processing speed in Adobe software, it may have been more of an issue when the file was uh, first developed back in 2004. I developed that was a photo pun, you see what I did there? But uh, with today's faster computers, it's really a non-issue. And in the extra time it takes to do the conversion, if you add in that extra time, I'd say it actually takes more time to use DNG. Sure, those sidecar files can be a minor inconvenience, but if you're storing your RAW files in your Lightroom or Capture One library, you really never even see them. I use Photo Mechanic to cull through my images, and when I copy files using the program, it automatically takes those sidecar files with it. So it's rarely a problem. The file sizes, yes, can be smaller, but the original RAW files have full-size JPEG previews in them, which can be helpful when viewing your images in programs like Photo Mechanic. If you choose in the DNG to store a full-size preview, um, that pretty much wipes out any of the file savings. And to be honest, hard drives these days are much cheaper per gigabyte than they used to be, so the extra savings really isn't as much of an issue anymore. Um, and as for the file validation, I definitely see the value in this for historical archives for sure. You can actually run a check on a large number of images that were converted to DNG to confirm that they have not been corrupted. This shouldn't replace a solid backup strategy, of course, um, as all your files should be recoverable in the event of corruption anyway. So look, as you can imagine, I don't really see a need to do any large-scale conversion to DNG. I consider my camera RAW files to be the originals, just like a negative in the film days. Even if I could make a perfect print or even a perfect copy negative, I still wouldn't throw away the original, right? Um, are there any times when I've used DNG? Yes, I absolutely have. I do have some very old digital images from the 90s that were in a RAW format that's unsupported today by the camera manufacturers. Of course, I have final tone JPEG versions of all those images, but if I want to reprocess the RAW, which I have done, then the best option I have right now is to use Adobe's free DNG converter and then open that new file using Photoshop or Capture One. So you could say that the files we shoot today, maybe they won't be unreadable in 25 years as well, right? But I'm really not as worried about it. There are way more images being produced in today's RAW formats daily than there were probably shot in the entire decade of the 90s. There were probably only a few hundred of us at newspapers around the world shooting those early professional digi digital cameras, so not many of those old files even exist. It would be foolish for a camera manufacturer to stop supporting any of today's modern formats unless they go out of business, which we certainly hope they don't do. Yes, there's a public SDK for DNG files, but there are also lots of software companies, including Apple and Phase One, big companies that have done a pretty good job reverse engineering the camera raw files. Even Adobe does it as well. If you're really concerned about it, you could convert to DNG, but use the option to embed the original raw file in the DNG. This will give you much bigger files, but you can always get back to your original raw later if you want. Joseph, I hope that answers your question about if DNG is better. You now know my opinion. But uh, and Cody, you asked about compromising your post-processing ability. It really just depends on if and how well your software supports DNG. If you're in the Adobe bubble, then there's really no difference in quality as far as post-processing. If you use anything else, you might have to do some more tweaking to get your images looking just right. But the bottom line for me is that that little bit of extra protection by using DNG really doesn't come close 
to making up for all of the inconveniences of switching to the format. I'm glad the format exists for those few times I need it, but I would not personally convert my entire archive, and I would never, ever, ever throw away my original raw files. So why not just work with those and keep good backups of everything? What do you think? Do you use DNG? Do you think I'm doing it all wrong? Am I crazy? Let me know in the comments down below. Bring it on. And thanks, as always, for joining me. Don't forget, if you have your own photo questions, go submit them at askdavidbergman.com. Also, really huge thanks to the kind folks at Adorama who have continued to support photographers as they have for literally decades. So if you haven't already, please like and subscribe and make sure you'll get all the latest and greatest free photo content from the Adorama TV hosts like myself and a bunch of others. I will see you back here every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern on the next episode of Ask David Bergman.